I don't know. We just we're so busy that we haven't been going to many churches. We've been holding our own meetings, but when we got Phil's invitation, I just felt like the Lord said, "Come." So, man, that's a good deal. Appreciate it. Let me real quickly just advertise some products. This is a brand new product that we've got out. It's a Spirit, Soul, and Body Illustrated. A guy in Germany heard me teach on this, and he just illustrated this with uh, three little guys. Spirit, soul, and body, and it's really neat. And uh, he took my teaching that is about probably six hours and uh, edited it into a 15-minute presentation, and you basically get the whole thing in 15 minutes animated. It's really, really good. So uh, we have these. Uh, Renee, I'll let you give these to somebody. This is Renee and Mike Buller. They're with us, and if you look like you want it... And this is a book entitled How to Become a Water Walker based on Matthew chapter 14 about Peter walking on the water. And in that little uh, example is about everything you need to know about faith. It's really a great example. So here's one on how to become a water walker. And this one's entitled An Excellent Spirit. I just got through teaching this on uh, television. And this is taken from the book of... Uh, uh, the book of where? Daniel. Did you want this one? Yeah, I do. No. All right. <laughs> and here, it, we have all of our books are also in these study guides. And these study guides, this one's shrink wrapped, but on, inside there is a, uh, a data CD where the whole thing is here. And you can print this out. It basically just has, uh, you know, kind of radical statements. You read a paragraph or two. Then you ask questions, and there are no right or wrong answers. You just let the people answer them however they want to. And then at the end, you look up the scriptures, and the scriptures answer the questions. So this is a discipleship tool specifically designed to teach uh, Bible studies. So if somebody would use this to teach a Bible study, we'll give this to you. Okay, but you got to be teaching a Bible study. And then real quickly, uh, it looks like this is ours too. You've already got it, so stop trying to get it. That's the title of one of my teachings. So. Anyway, we'll let somebody have a mug. And then I'd like to announce this. If you haven't heard of this, this is our Declaration of Dependence Upon God and His Holy Bible. And this is in response to the uh, Supreme Court's ruling that now homosexual marriage is, they say, a constitutional right. It violates all of our constitutional rights, our state rights, but... The main thing, it violates our stand from the Word of God. So I wrote this little thing, and it's really, really simple. And uh, you can go to our website, and you can see a video about this that is really good. And then we have now about 40,000 people who have signed this. And uh, in June, we are going to go on papers and into social media and different things nationwide and we're trying to get over a million signatures and we're going to present this to the White House to all of the people running for uh, president and things like that. and I won't take time to read it but it's really awesome so we have copies of that out there and Renee will give that to somebody if you act like you want it praise the Lord Again, let me just say it's a real blessing to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. I just met Phil Wednesday night. He was at our place with uh, Creflo, and I just met Belinda this morning. So uh, I'm just getting to know them, but I sure like what I see. Man, I love the praise and worship. Love the vision that they got. Love that they're believing God and stretching out. And Man, it's just awesome. Praise God. So it's great, great things happening. And I hadn't got to see Neow in years, it seems like. Has it been years? 2010, I guess, is when she graduated. So what a blessing that is. All right, praise the Lord. Well, we just have a short period of time. So let's turn over to 1 Kings chapter 17. And I want to share some things with you that I've been meditating on this uh, for the last week or two, nearly exclusively. And God has just really spoken some things to me through this. And, you know, it says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10... Uh, verses 6 through 11, that all of the things that happened under the Old Covenant were written for our admonition, for our learning, so that we can learn through them and not make the same mistakes. And one of the things that I see happening is that a lot of people, they just really are scripturally ignorant. 
And I don't mean that critical, but it's just the truth. Most of us do not learn through the Word of God and other people's expense. We have to go out and make all of the mistakes on our own. And I tell you, that's not the way to do it. Uh, it's much, much better to learn at somebody else's expense. And so one of the things that God has done in my life is He's used these stories that are in the Bible to direct me and give me direction. And you know what? I didn't have to go out and commit adultery and live in sexual immorality to learn that that stuff's wrong. I looked at David and saw how much it cost him and the terrible tragedy and all of the things that happened. And so this is what the Bible is for, especially for you young people in here. Don't go out and experiment and figure out everything on your own. There's a better way. Amen. It's like going and beating your head against the wall. You could do that, but I can tell you, it doesn't feel good. You don't have to experience it firsthand. You can learn at other people's expense. And so here are some uh, things that I've learned through the life of Elijah. I have a teaching entitled Lessons from Elijah, and it is really, really powerful. Elijah is one of the greatest examples in the Bible. He's the very first person that ever saw a person raised from the dead right here in 1 Kings chapter 17. And when he did it, there was no promise that you could raise people from the dead. We have a promise. As a matter of fact, we have a command in Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, to go heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, and raise the dead. So we have a command to do it. There was no command. There was no precedent for it. Nobody had ever done it before. And there was no promises that you could do these kind of things. So this was really significant that this man saw a person raised from the dead when it had never been done or spoken about before. And Elijah called fire down out of heaven. He saw a great revival. He saw the entire nation turn to God, which is something that we need to see today. He was a powerful man of God. He got so fired up, he outran a chariot with the chariot having a head start, and he ran 20 miles and outran the chariot. He ended the drought, and he was just a powerful man of God, but he also fell probably harder than any other person did. And God was speaking to him in an audible voice, told him three things to do, and he flat out disobeyed two-thirds of the things that God told him to do in an audible voice because he was afraid that Jezebel was going to kill him. So he was one of the greatest examples, but also one of the greatest failures ever recorded in Scripture. And then in 2 Kings chapter 2, even though he failed so badly and Naboth died because of Elijah not doing what God told him to do. People died because he didn't obey God. You would think that that would be the end of it. But did you know he recovered? And you talk about grace. You can see the grace of God even in the Old Testament because this man who failed miserably in two-thirds of the things that God told him to do walked with God and he didn't die. He got just caught up into heaven in a whirlwind. So a guy who didn't do everything right and failed big time still walked with God so much that he just got translated into heaven. So there are some great, great lessons to learn through Elijah, good and bad. So here in 1 Kings chapter 17, I just want to start reading with verse 1. And this is the very first mention of Elijah in the Bible right here. And it says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now this is really significant because he didn't have an inroad into the um, king. He didn't have, uh, you know, a history of knowing these people. As a matter of fact, if you were to Back up, let me just read one verse here out of uh, 1 Kings chapter 16, talking about Ahab in verse 30. It says, And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Ahab and his wife Jezebel were the two most wicked people that had ever ruled the nation of Israel at this time. And as you go into the 8th chapter, you'll find out that they had totally tried to stamp out the worship of God. And they had instituted Baal worship and anybody who was a prophet of God, they were putting to death. And so Elijah, he wasn't the son of a prophet. He didn't have an inroad to the king or anything. And he walked up to the king and immediately identified himself with the Lord by saying, as the Lord God of Israel liveth. And he put himself right in the crosshairs. This is one of the very first things you learn 
about Elijah is that he had a word from God and because of it, he was public. He spoke out publicly his faith in the Lord when Ahab and Jezebel had been killing all of the prophets of God. He put his life on the line. And here's one of the very first things I learned from Elijah, and that is that he was not afraid of man. He was not afraid of people's criticism. And did you know, if he would have just uh, taken the prophecy of Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 16 and 17, I won't take time to turn over there and read it, but if you read that, the Lord prophesied through Moses and said, if you don't seek the Lord and if you don't follow his ways, then God will send a drought and break uh, this stubbornness that's on the inside of you. So basically all he did was have what the scripture said would happen and he had this word from God, but he stood up and boldly proclaimed it and said, it's not going to rain in this land or even have dew until I say so. You know, if he would have just stayed in his prayer closet and prayed and said, Oh God, Deuteronomy 11, verses 16 and 17 says there would be a drought. I'm calling for this drought. And if he would have prayed and if the drought would have happened and then at the end of the drought, if he would have stood up and he said, This is what God's word said. I called for this. This is the judgment of God. Did you know nobody would have believed him? Because they would have thought, Well, it was just circumstantial. It just happened and here you are taking credit for it. But when Elijah stood up and proclaimed this, it had been raining. There wasn't a drought at the time. And here he was saying things in advance. If you read over in Isaiah chapter 8, the Lord even used this exact same example. And he said, before it happens, I'm going to tell you so that when these things happen, you won't think that your idol brought it to pass. And so the Lord prophesied and said things in advance so that when it came to pass the way he said, people would recognize it was God's intervention. And likewise, this is what Elijah did. Elijah didn't just pray and ask God to intervene. He stood up and proclaimed the word of the Lord. And this has direct application to us. And one of the things I think that is, you know, as bad as I dislike the Supreme Court's ruling and some of the things that have happened, the thing that's even disturbed me more is Christians' reactions to it. And there's a lot of Christians that have basically just accepted that, you know what, our nation's going in a certain direction. It's now politically incorrect to be an outspoken Christian, to believe in the Word of God, to believe in healing and deliverance and miracles and things like this. And there's a lot of Christians that have just, it's silenced them, and they've basically embraced this and accepted it as the way it has to be. That is wrong, 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 wrong. We need to be vocal. We need to be standing up. You know, this teaching that I talked about with Daniel having an excellent spirit. He was one of the leaders in the nation of Babylon and they passed this law that no man could pray or make a petition of any person but the king for 30 days. And it specifically says in Daniel chapter 6 that after Daniel knew that the law had been signed into effect, he opened up his windows and openly prayed three times a day exactly the way he had done before. That is civil disobedience. That is, that is a believer directly countering the laws of the land when they go contrary to the word of God. And we got a lot of Christians today that are afraid to stand up and speak. If Elijah hadn't have spoken the word of God, he wouldn't have gained the position that he had. I'm not going to have time today, but if you turn over to the 18th chapter, you find out that after this three years of drought, Elijah showed up and he was in control. There wasn't a nation on the planet that the king of Israel hadn't searched for Elijah. And when they said he's not here, he made them sign something that he wasn't there because he was looking everywhere for Elijah. And when Elijah finally showed up, he told the king, he says, you assemble all of the people and all the prophets together and we're going to have a contest between God and Baal and see who's the real God. And Elijah was in control. Elijah was telling the king what to do. And the king in 24 hours obeyed his commands and did whatever Elijah told him to do. You know why? Because he had a word from God and he wasn't afraid to speak it. There's a lot of Christians that have a word from God, but they're afraid to speak. They're afraid somebody's going to roll their eyes at them or call them a fanatic or 
or say that you're a bigot or something because you stand for morality and for doing the right thing. I'm telling you, we're not the ones that should feel weird. <laughs> the perverts are the ones that ought to be feeling weird. We shouldn't feel like we're strange. Amen. Now, the Bible does say that we're supposed to speak the truth in love, and so I'm not telling us to go out there and be mean. We've seen Christians that do things wrong. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm saying that you got to love people. you got to tell people the truth. And there are many of you that people that you work with, friends and neighbors, they're living lives that are destroying them. It's wrong. You know it's wrong. You've got a word from God, and yet you won't say it. I'm not saying this to hurt anybody. I'm trying to encourage us that, you know what, this is what sets us apart. The only thing that made Elijah different than any other person in this nation was that he had a word from God, and he wasn't afraid to say it. Did you know what? You have words from God. And somebody says, well, I don't know that I do have a word from God. If you're born again, you got a word from God. The Bible says you got born again by the incorruptible seed, the word of God. You receive truth about true salvation, about your need for God, and you had truth revealed to you, and your opinion of God is better than the people that don't know God. Amen. Did you know somehow or another we've got people, well, I would never, you know, I'm just a, I'm just a person. I'm not just a person. I've been born again. I've got God living on the inside of me. God has changed my life. I've seen my son raised from the dead. I've seen blind eyes open, deaf ears open. I've seen miracles happen. And you know what? My opinion of God is better than people that don't know God. Amen. And some of you think, well, that's arrogant. No, it's the truth. You know, this friend of mine, Cliff Coulter, was out witnessing to a guy one time. And this guy broke down. He was in his home. He broke down. He got to crying. He was under conviction. And Clifton said, well, let's pray and just ask Jesus into your life. And he says, you know what? I'm just not sure I'm ready. He says, let me think about this a while. And he says, I'll come back to you. And so Clifton was going to let him do it, and he was leaving, and as he was leaving the house, he was standing at the front door, and the Lord spoke to him and said, hey, who's the professional here? And Clifton thought, well, what do you mean professional? And he said, who makes their living talking about God. And Clifton says, well, I guess I do. I'm the pastor. I'm a professional. And he says, why are you letting his opinion of God trump your opinion of God? The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. And he says, don't let him tell you. You're the guy that I'm paying to do this stuff. <laughs> and so Clifton told him that. He says, I'm the professional. He says, you know what? You need to be born again now. And that guy says, you're right. And he just got born again. But brothers and sisters, there's a spirit of antichrist in this world. We call it political correctness. But you know all it is, it's a demonic spirit. And it is a spirit against Christ and everything that's godly. It's not the spirit of Muhammad. It's not the spirit of anti-Muhammad or anti-Buddha or anti-anything else. You can do any of those things and nobody will say a word against you. They won't even profile you if you're sitting there carrying a gun because that might be judgmental. <laughs> But you know what? Boy, you're a Christian, and I mean, you're the only person that you can speak against. It is a spirit of antichrist. It is demonic, and Christians are cowing to it and giving in to it constantly. That's what this whole declaration of dependence is about. It's saying we aren't going to bend. We won't bow. We aren't going to change. There are things that are right, and there are things that are wrong. Homosexuality is wrong. Bestiality is wrong. Murder is wrong. Adultery is wrong. There are things that are right and wrong. Now, we love the people, and I'm preaching to them. Matter of fact, I just had uh, three of our students this last week come up, and they've all come out of a homosexual lifestyle, and they're still struggling with some things. And they came up, and I prayed with them and loved on them. And I said, man, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're getting hold of the Word of God. We're glad to help you. There's not a single person in our school that's condemning them. We love them. But I hate homosexuality because it's killing people. 
Homosexuals have 300 times as much spousal abuse as heterosexual couples. They die 20 to 21 years earlier than heterosexuals do. Did you know cigarette smoking takes an average of seven years off of your life? And yet we put a warning label on cigarettes. If we weren't politically correct, if we weren't hypocrites, we ought to plaster right across every homosexual's forehead. Warning, this is hazardous to your health, amen. <laughs> but we won't do that. That's not politically correct. I'm telling you, we need to love people enough to tell them the truth. Amen. You know, I live way up in the mountains of Colorado, and I, there, was a, there was a dark night, the, no uh, moon out. It was uh, rainy and uh, things in any way, it was foggy. You could just barely, I could barely see from like here to the back of this room. And a car passed me going 60 miles an hour. And as soon as it got around this corner, I saw its brake lights come on and this thing was thrown to the right. And I could tell it hit something. So I slammed on my brakes and I came to rest on the shoulder. The guy was in the right lane. In the left lane was a horse that he had hit and it had it had caved in the windshield and he was laying there bleeding and things like this and I got out and as I was standing there trying to help him a suburban came around the corner and hit this horse and it launched that suburban about I don't know five or ten feet high in the air and maybe 20 or 25 feet and this woman was able to regain control and she stopped I ran up to see what had gone what had happened with her and her head had made a bump in the roof of her vehicle where her, she hit that thing. And anyway, cars were coming around this corner. It was dark, it was uh, foggy, it was on a curve you couldn't see. And so what I did, I ran down the road, around the corner, and started jumping out in front of cars that were going 50 and 60 miles an hour. And they could barely see me. And people were stopping and sliding. I had some slide onto the shoulder of the road, people were screaming at me and honking and doing things, and I'm sure they said some choice words about me. <laughs> Here it was, late at night, dark, a guy out trying to stop cars on a mountain road. I'm sure I got some terrible comments, but when they got around the corner and saw that there was this wreck, you know what? I bet you that some of those same people that cursed me love me all of a sudden. <laughs> And did you know in, in uh, Leviticus 19, 18 is where it says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Everybody quotes that one. But did you back up into 19, 17, Leviticus 19, 17, it says, Thou shalt not hate thy neighbor in thine heart, but thou shalt in any wise rebuke him and not suffer sin upon him. And then the next verse says, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. People take that out of context and say it's love to just sit here and let a person do whatever. It's not. If you have a word from God, if you know the truth, if you know that sin kills, the way of the transgressor is hard, and on and on we could go with all of these truths from the word of God, and you do not tell people the truth, you can say what you want to, but you do not love them, you love yourself, and you don't want to suffer the rejection that might go with it. Thank you for that thunderous silence. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's the truth to tell a person the truth. And because Elijah spoke this word, then three years later, when the drought had devastated the place, he was in control. You might, you might work with some people that if you stand there and say the truth and speak what the Word of God has to say and stand for godliness and morality, People may make fun of you, but the scripture says that God reveals himself from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. And I can guarantee you there's coming a time where they're doping and drinking and carousing ways are going to catch up with them. And they're going to realize this is wrong. And if you spoke the truth to them in love, they'll know where to go to when they have a need. But if you haven't spoken the truth, they won't know. There are some people that if people at your workplace found out that you went to church on Sunday, they'd be shocked. 
you blend in, nobody could tell you're a Christian. That's not right. I'm not saying these things to condemn you, but to motivate you. We've got a word from God. This is the only thing that set Elijah apart was that he knew the word of God and he was bold enough to stand up and say it. The world is looking for somebody who will take a stand and believe something. You know, I get people, I got lots of people that hate me and criticize me, but I have a lot of people that disagree with me that respect me because at least I'll say the truth and they know that I'm going to tell them the truth and I'm not afraid to tell a person what's right and wrong. And even some of my critics, you know, I've read some of the blogs against me and they start out and I read them and I thought, this is really good. Because before they stab me in the back and say how terrible I am, they'll say, well, he's different than others. At least, you, you know, he believes it and he's trying, telling people the truth. And I think it's pretty nice, some of the things that they say about it. <laughs> so anyway, people will respect you, even if they don't agree with you. We, we don't have to agree on everything, but man, you've got words from God. If you've been born again, you've got a word from God about he heaven and hell about someday you're going to be accountable to God and the world needs to hear this word. You need to speak your word boldly. If you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit and understand speaking in tongues. I was just visiting with Lori and they were telling me about their son started speaking in tongues and I said, man, that'll change your life. If you've got that revelation, the average person, even the average Christian out here doesn't have that revelation. You need to speak it and start talking about how powerful and essential the baptism of the Holy Spirit is in people's lives. If you understand about healing, about faith, and about giving, and on and on and on it goes, man, we need to be speaking these things. The church is in their prayer closet praying that God will change people's lives, but the Bible didn't say that prayer will set you free. It's the truth that will set you free. You got to speak the truth and then pray over it. Prayer is like water or fertilizer, but if you water barren ground, it won't produce. You've got to plant the seed of God's Word. So Elijah showed up and he just walked up to the king who was killing anybody who identified with the Lord. And he said, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Man, I like that. And you know, another thing, they had changed it to where Israel was no longer a godly nation. It was now a Baal nation. There's people today saying America is no longer a Christian nation. Well, let me say that America isn't acting like a Christian nation. The Supreme Court isn't ruling consistent with Christian values and stuff, and I will agree with that. But America was founded on Christian principles. And even though, you know, people may have rejected God, God has not yet rejected America. I don't believe it's too late for America. This, this was a terrible situation. They were killing anybody who identified with God. It hadn't gone that far in America yet. But you know what? We could stand up. And if he stood up and he caused an entire revival, the entire nation fell on their face saying, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. And I mean, they saw a tremendous revival and they saw all of the prophets of Baal killed. It was awesome. It was a worse situation. It was in the old covenant. What we have in the new covenant is better. We could see this nation turned around. America may not be claiming God, but God hadn't forsaken America yet. And we need to stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord God of America. And we need to speak the word. That's another lesson that I learned right here. So he spoke the word. Man, I'm talking as fast as I can, and I only got through the first verse.
mercy. Let me just say some things real quickly. He said here in, chat, in verse 2, the, Lord, the word of the Lord came unto him saying, and this second word was about how God was going to protect him from the king that was going to try and kill him and how he would sustain him through the drought. And it goes on to say in verse 3, Get thee hence and turn thee eastward and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan, and it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Man, this is awesome. You know, there's a lot of people. We have people come to our Bible school and they, they say, God, do you want me to do this or not? And I have people come up to me by the hundreds and say, God has told me to come to Karis Bible College, but... And then they will tell me all of the problems that they've got. I remember this one guy in Chicago came up and he says, but my parents had never heard of you. And so they went and asked the pastor of their church and they said, he's a cult. Stay away from that. And so the parents rejected it. And he worked in a family business and the parents were going to disinherit him. He would lose his business. He would lose his inheritance. He would lose his relationship with his family. He was engaged to be married. And his fiance said, if you go to that school, I'm going to divorce you or not divorce you, but I won't marry you. And so he stood to lose all of these things. So he, he started by saying, God told me without a doubt to come to Karis Bible College, but, and then he told me all of this stuff. And he spent about 20 minutes telling me all of this. And then he says, what do you think? And I said, you lost me the moment you said God told you to come. If God told you to come, you just come. And he says, but what about all these other things? I said, come. If it hair lips the devil, come. You just do what God... I said, I don't relate to people who know that God wants them to do something and they're going to debate it, whether they're going to do it or not. That's not right. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. But you've got to follow what God tells you to do. Do you know Abraham was commanded to leave his father's house, all of his brethren, and go out to inherit a land? And he didn't obey God fully. He waited in Haran until his father died, until his brother died. And then he took his nephew Lot with him. And I'm sure that part of the logic was that Lot was now without a father. He was young. He probably needed some help. And Abraham probably meant well. He probably thought, I'm going to do right by my nephew. But God told him to leave his father's house and all of his brethren. He did not obey God. And it wasn't until the 14th chapter of Genesis when Lot and Abraham separated that the blessing of God was really spoken clear and says, Now count the stars in the sky or the grains of sand on the seashore, so shall your seed be. It was only after he separated from Lot. And let me just ask you, how could things have turned out any worse for Lot if Abraham would have just obeyed God. It turns out that because Lot came with Abraham, he wound up living in Sodom and Gomorrah, and his wife was turned into a pillar of salt. He had two daughters, because it says he went into the city to talk to his daughters, plural, so we know that there was at least two that did not come out with him, and so them, their husbands, their children were all destroyed in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. His wife was turned into a pillar of salt, and the two daughters that he brought with him, they had been so corrupted by living in this evil place that they actually committed incest with their fathers and became pregnant through incest. How could it have been any worse for Lot? How could he have lost any more if he would have stayed in Ur of the Chaldees and Abraham just obeyed God? I'm...
telling you, regardless of what you say, there's people that say, well, I'm only five years away from retirement, so God's told me to do something and I'll, I'll wait until retirement because that makes sense to you. You don't want to lose your maximum retirement. Mike Buller right here was two years away from retiring from the California Highway Patrol with maximum retirement, but, you know, God doesn't understand things like this. God doesn't, <laughs> God doesn't know you're only two years away from retirement, and so he just spoke to Mike about coming to school, and Mike and Renee had enough wisdom to just obey God and do what God told them to do, and it was a good decision for them. I'm telling you, God's not going to show you step number two until you do step number one. And yet people, people are constantly saying, oh God, if I do this, well then what about this? And what about this? And what? You're going to miss God. If God has shown you something to do, do it. Elijah spoke to the king, prophesied a drought in the name of the Lord, could have been killed for it, and he didn't know where God was going to send him and how God was going to protect him. God's word about his protection didn't come until he obeyed the first word. One of the reasons it works this way is because God loves us so much, he doesn't, make you, he doesn't want to make you accountable for step one through ten. He's just going to show you one thing at a time, and if you fail to obey him, you'll only be guilty of disobeying one thing that he showed you instead of ten things that he showed you. Plus, without faith, it's impossible to please God. He wants you to depend upon him. He doesn't want you to just seek him for a week, get enough direction to last you for ten years, and then he not see you or hear from you for the next ten years. He wants to show you things one step at a time so that you just stay in relationship with Him and as you follow His guidance, you, you stay in relationship with Him. So God says, I've commanded, look at this in verse 4, I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Boy, here is one of the great truths and this is the last thing I'm going to be able to say this morning. There's a lot more. But here's one of the great revelations I've gotten out of Elijah. Did you know that Elijah obeyed God, did what God told him to do, but a, God sent Elijah's provision not to where he was, but to where he told him to go. He says, I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. If Elijah would have stayed where he was, did you know God said, I have commanded. He had already spoken to the ravens, so the ravens were already on their way. Did you know that the bread and the flesh and the supply would have been there? God would have been faithful to send it. But from Elijah's perspective, it would have been God didn't take care of him. And I meet people all the time that say, I'm praying and believing God for provision, and yet they don't see it. And they say, well, God didn't come through. God hadn't supplied my need. There's people who tell me that God told them to come to Bible college. And they say, God, you give me the finances. You make everything work out. You fix all of these things, and then I'll go obey. But God isn't going to send your provision to where you are. He sends your provision to where he told you to go, to there. There is a place called there for every one of you. And if you aren't seeing supernatural provision, it's because you aren't all there. <laughs> You're too much here. You know, I was talking to Phil this morning and I was just asking him a few questions and you know, you move from the warehouse to here, it's a lot more expensive. There's all kinds of more expenses that you've...
got now than you had there, but did you know he says they've made the budget every single week and the provision is here where God told you to be. And yet there's a lot of people that say, oh God, you make all of the provisions so that there's no faith involved, so that I don't have to trust you in anything and then I will obey you. That's not the way it works. God is going to stretch every one of you and God's got a word for you and God wants to use you in your neighborhood, with your families, at work, and at different things, but you're going to have to start speaking God's word. And somebody says, but I could be fired. What would happen? So you're going to debate doing what God tells you to do because you might lose your job? Some of you are thinking, sure. <laughs> That's not true Christianity. You know what? Here's great theology. There's only one God, and you are not Him. And if God tells you to do something, you just do what God tells you to do, and it doesn't matter what the consequences are. You don't worry about it. Well, they could fire me. Well, God's got a better job for you. God will do something better. He'll provide for you. Well, somebody could persecute me, but somebody could be born again because they hear the truth and stuff like this. It is not up to you to debate and you to put your wisdom above God's wisdom. If God has shown you truth, if you don't have just religion, but if you have revelation knowledge of God's Word that has worked in your life, you are God's container that He wants to send this Word out into your workplace, into your family, into your neighborhood, and you need to speak the Word of God. And if you will do that, God will show you what the next step is. There will be supernatural provision Elijah became the number one influential person in the nation because he had a word from God and he wasn't afraid to speak it. You should become the number one influential person in your job, in your neighborhood, in your family. And that's because you have studied the word, you've got the revelation of God's word, and you know better than people that don't know God and don't study the Word. And your opinion is better than their opinion and you should speak it. You need to get free from this spirit of Antichrist and we need to recognize what we've got. The Word of God is so powerful. Man, I'm out of time. I'm way over time. Forgive me. But in the name of Jesus, I believe God's going to help you to receive all of this. You know, if there's anybody here this morning that doesn't know Jesus personally, I'm telling you, the word of the Lord is you must be born again. Going to church, being religious, acknowledging that God exists is not enough for salvation. The Bible says even the devils believe and tremble. But won't you know, O oh vain man, that faith without works is dead. You have to make Jesus your Lord, not just acknowledge that he exists and then live your life contrary to him. You have to submit to him. If there's, nobody, if there's anybody here who's never done that, I'd like to pray with you. And then also, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which includes speaking in tongues. It's more to it than that, but it includes speaking in tongues. And I tell you, if you don't speak in tongues, it's like charging hell with a water pistol. <laughs> Jesus said you would receive power after that the Holy Ghost came upon you. You need to get power. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit will make you stronger than horseradish. Amen. So if there's anybody here who doesn't have one or both of those, if you aren't born again or if you have been born again, but if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'd like to pray with you. Anybody here who would say, that's me, and I want you to pray with me. Anybody? Yep, we got some people right here. Anybody else? Praise God. Man, this is awesome. You know, if you would, would you just come down here and we want to pray?